All right. Revelation chapter 2. We're finishing the church, the first of the seven churches of uh, Ephesus. We spoke about the angel of the church. We're not sure who this messenger is to the church, but whoever it is does not detract or diminish from uh, the message or the receptivity of it. It's interesting when you read what is written to the church at Ephesus. I know thy works. This is said to every church. The Lord knows every church's work. And when, when, when we see a letter written to the church, whether it's Ephesus or Smyrna or Pergamum or Thyatira, whoever, or if it's to the common churches that we know of in the New Testament, uh, Thessalonica, Philippi, Colossae, I hope that we still have the ability to apply those letters to churches, to us. Now, I know, you know, in theory, we understand that we are the church. But when we're studying what is written to the church at Ephesus, I hope that we can, you know, in some way in our minds think that this is being written to Christians, to us specifically. So when we see a statement like, I know your works, written to the church, I hope that just right under that, I can say, Matt, the Lord knows my works. And the Lord knows your works. And let's not make, it, it's kind of like John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world. When we read that, what do we usually understand? God loves people out there. Sometimes we don't include us there personally, individually. Listen, this is how the Word of God <clears throat> dwells you personally. And we need to allow it to do that. He's saying to us as well, I know your works. <coughs> now, I want you to note, as you have read the letter to the church at Ephesus here, in the Revelation. When you read that section, what about their works? When, when the Lord is saying here, and as John is writing, and he's writing to the church, and they read, I know your works, to the church at Ephesus, was that a good thing or a bad thing? That was not a good thing. Now, why wasn't it? Because they had left their first love. When you do that, you've lost it all, folks. If you leave Jesus Christ, you've lost, you've lost it all. <clears throat> you know, you can do some works that might salve a conscience. But if you've left Jesus Christ, and you know, sometimes when we read this, we make this much more difficult than it is. This is not a difficult thing to understand. Let me illustrate. When you became a Christian, when I became a Christian, you remember what the first works were? Number one, we couldn't wait to tell somebody what we did. We couldn't wait to convert somebody. You know, the church at Ephesus stopped evangelizing. The church at Ephesus, the only way that it could be said generally about the church stopping to evangelize is that the individual Christians in their daily lives stopped evangelizing. You can't do your evangelizing for me. And I know that this runs contrary to many religious people's thinking, but preachers can't do the members evangelizing for them or the elders or whoever. You know, it's not a... You know, well, I've got my talents here, but evangelizing is just not one of them, so I'll let somebody else do that part. No. If he's saying this to Ephesus, I know your works, and many of the things that he complimented them, did you notice what it was about? It was about what they thought. Here is a classic church that hates false doctrine. 
You know, we're going to talk about here the Nicolaitans, and, and, and they were patient through that, and, and they hated their deeds. And have you ever known, have you ever known churches that they were so much about false doctrine that they didn't evangelize, that they didn't love people? That's the balance in a congregation we want to find. Yes, I mean, the Lord here is not downgrading at all teaching against false doctrine. But if that's the sum core of a congregation's spiritual DNA, <coughs> then something's wrong. We need to be converting people as much as we're <coughs> more than we are dealing with falsehood. And that gets back to this idea of a sound church. You know, for a lot of years, I thought soundness was equated with how much false doctrine we could be against. And it took a while to grow out of, grow out of that. Soundness just means healthy. And here, the church at Ephesus, they were great for being known against false teaching, but they weren't great... Overall, because, you know, and the, you know what else this tells me? I can be against false teaching and still leave my first love. Aha. Uh -huh. What is the primary purpose of being against false teaching? It's not just to show how much we know and to play one upmanship with false teaching or a false teacher or false doctrine. That's not the reason. The reason is. To keep the church pure because we love the church. So if, if, if one is castigating false teaching, you know, attitude has a lot to do with that, doesn't it? It has a lot to do with it. Why am I doing it? Why are you doing it? But here, they were against the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. What is that? I hope you studied enough to know what that is so we can have a... A good discussion, but you're going to have to go a little bit deeper than the surface here to know what the doctrine of the Nicolaitans even was. But they hated that, and they didn't put up with that stuff, you see. But still, they had left their first love. How do you leave your first love? Well, you think of the first work. When you were baptized, did you say a few more prayers, do you think? When you were first baptized, than you do now. If you, if that's true, then you have left or are leaving your first love. How about reading the scripture? Did you, did you read the Bible more when we first became a Christian than you do now? If, if if you do, then you're leaving your first love. You see those first works. Aren't we encouraged to do the first works? When I leave my first love, I leave the first works. And that's what Ephesus was doing. They were, to a large degree, going through the motions. Their Christianity wasn't real on a day-to-day -day basis. They were, if you will, going to church. And that was it. The Lord says, I know your works. Yeah, you're against false teaching. And then he says, but I have someone against you. And that somewhat is a big somewhat. We've got to make sure that our personal relationship with the Lord, which equates to daily Christian living, is on fire. Are you on fire today, spiritually? We're going to be talking about that next hour. Go ahead, John. Yeah, one of the problems and, and all that, and one of the things I used to struggle with is how can you be doing those things for the Lord that are listed here? And still forsake your first love. A lot of those, a lot of us that, that fall into that are falling into that because we think we're fulfilling that love. Because we love Christ and that's what we're doing. But we're leaving the little out of it, as you said. First love. And not just something we put first, but something that is that happens from the first. Yes. And it's what, what Christ put forth from the first. And the same love he had, and that was for the lost. If we don't have that love for the lost, everything else we do is gone. That, that's exactly right. Well said. The reason why came, Christ came to this earth, the bottom line, is to seek and to save the lost. 
And if that's not our reason for existence, then we need to make sure that we're not in danger, like the church at Ephesus, of leaving our first love. Christianity is not just what we're against, I guess, is the lesson from Ephesus. That's why some of the churches today that fall into that same kind of category um, are so strong on it because they think they're, they're fulfilling that love. That That's right. Have. That's right. And look what he says in verses 2 and 3. I know your works, I know your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear them which are evil. They were, they were wonderful at that. And you have tried them which say they are apostles. A lot of uh, fake apostles in the first century. Going through Asia Minor. That's why Paul had to be so ardent in his own defense of his apostleship. Uh, there are those. They were itinerant preachers, if you will. Going, going through Asia Minor, claiming to preach the gospel, and they weren't. Apostles. What does what does the word apostle? Now, all of these. I don't know if all of these. I know when we read this, we think that they were saying that they were one of the thirteen apostles. Not necessarily. What does the word apostle mean? Simply one sent. One sent with authority. Maybe they were claiming to be a part of the specific apostleship, but maybe not. Maybe not. But whatever they were, they were teaching falsely, and the church at Ephesus didn't put up with it, and that was a good thing. They have found them to be liars. You've borne them, you've had patience, and for my name's sake, you've labored in this context, and you've not fainted. You're still, you know, you're still going on. But then he says in verse 4, I have someone against you. You know, it's like, wow. You've left that first love. Jeremiah, didn't he plead for the children of God to return to Jehovah? He told them that they had forsaken God. They had, uh, that, uh, remember when they, when they had married God at Mount Sinai with the covenant? God had been faithful with them across the centuries. He had blessed them, but he asked, can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. They left their bride. They left their first love. The Lord is saying that's not good. Leaving one's first love is a tragic thing. And it's often a gradual thing. It doesn't happen overnight. And that's why it's so important to talk about these things. Well... Some churches are like that. I have visited churches that have a reputation for being sound. And many times I've found them sound. Sound asleep. And they're not evangelizing. They say, look at all what we're doing. Look at all these things we're doing. But are we bringing people to Christ? Do you know what the word Ichabod means? Have you ever heard of Ichabod Crane? Do you know what Ichabod means? Especially in the context in 1 Samuel chapter 4. The word means the glory has departed. The glory has departed. When I think of leaving your first love, spiritually speaking, the glory has departed. We're a bunch, or could possibly be, a bunch of Ichabods. That's what he's telling the church at Ephesus here. Uh, the members no longer sing as they used to sing. They never pray as much as they pray. They don't study the scriptures as much. And this truly is the tragedy of tragedy because communication is what helps a relationship, right? No matter what relationship that is. So he writes to them and he says, remember, remember, if you've left something, the Lord then says, remember from where you are fallen and what? Change your mind. Repent. 
Change your mind the way you're thinking. Oh, yeah, I need to get to that neighbor I've never talked to in 10 years. I want to keep my relationship with my first love, so I do those things. I do not just works, but I've got to remember and go all the way back and do which works? First works. First works. The first works from when? The first works from when I covenanted with Jesus Christ to be married to him when I became a child. Those are the first ones. Those are the fundamental ones. You know, sometimes it's important for Christians, for marriages, for different organizations to just step back, take a deep breath, and get back to the basics. And that's basically what's being said here. You have emphasized so much this idea of dealing with false teachers. You've actually, in the doing of that, left your first love. Wow. Memory's a great thing, isn't it? If it weren't for memory, the prodigal son could never have been saved. If it isn't for memory, none of us could ever be saved. Because you know what repentance implies? Memory. Because what am I changing my life to? What am I changing my mind to? Memory. What's it say on our communion table? Memory. Yeah. Memory is a great <coughs> blessing. Have you ever thanked God for memory? Memory, when we recall in our heart, our, the biblical heart, the mind, what the Bible calls the spirit. When I refresh my spirit, I bring certain things to, to its memory. That's a great thing. And even some things that I would care not to remember, if I'm a faithful Christian, in what context can I put those things? I don't have to face that. <clears throat> Grateful for the blood of Christ taking care of that. Memory is a great thing. Don't ever discount memory. Remember from where you are fallen. Fallen? They left their first love and they fell from grace. Oh my goodness. How clear that is. Do you mean it's possible for a Christian so to fall? Could he leave his first love and actually be said he has fallen? You know, in order to fall from somewhere, I had to be at that place. So I had to have salvation sometime to fall from it. I had to have a hot personal relationship with the Lord to fall from it. Remember from where you're fallen and change your mind and do the first works. And why should I do that when that idea first comes to mind and not try to put that off? Because today is the day of salvation, right? And the Lord is coming quickly in judgment, either in person or not. <clears throat> and he's going to remove the candlestick. Now, yes. The initial context is to the church collectively. But can someone here tell us why this would not apply to the Christian individual? The candlestick was the church, local church, and he was going to remove that. That's right. And he can remove it from our individual lives as much as he can remove it from a church. That's an interesting thought that we might want to get into in more detail later on. You know, exactly when. And can you tell exactly when? Is it possible to know when a candlestick is removed from a church? Yeah. Because, you know, if it were me, I think I would have removed the uh, candlestick of Corinth a lot, lot, a lot sooner than perhaps it was, if it was, with all of those issues. When the light goes out, you know it's gone. Yeah. And when the light goes out, when it's gone, it's, it's gone. <clears throat> And he'll only be forbearing so long. And he'll only be forbearing so long. Absolutely. That's right. But how long he has done it. How long he did that with Israel and how long he does that with spiritual Israel. 
But as you said, the light, I mean, we're talking about us. We're supposed to be the light to the world. When that light goes out at the church, you can't stick, there's no need for it. So it's gone. Right. And you're talking spiritual, not physical items. Right. You are the light of the world. If the candlestick, or if we have left the Lord, who is the, is the great light, we are to be reflectors of that light. If that leaves, then it's kind of like, not only does the light go out, it's like the salt losing its flavor. And we know what the Lord said about salt that loses its flavor. The worthiness of it after that point. Well, but he comes back, he comes back and says, you know, but this you have, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Well, that's kind of, that's kind of clear, isn't it? That's kind of um, abrupt, that's kind of, what words do we use there when we have to get on something like that? Um, that doesn't go over real well in our time, does it? Hate this teaching. What do you say? Man, wouldn't that wouldn't that go back to the thing? You know, losing your first love. Love is the motivation for reaching out to those that are in error. Yes. And yes. we should show the love instead yes. of the hate for the person. Absolutely. Absolutely. And my mind is taking to situations when fellowship has to be withdrawn. Another point is that I think the show that's that a loving act. Their life hasn't gone completely out. You know, it's, they have a certain amount of love. Who's? Their light, Ephesus, their, their light hasn't gone completely out. They, they haven't fully forsaken the love. But they have a love for those that are still trying in any way to change them. And I don't know if that's because they think they're right and they're going to stick by it right or whether they really had a love for them. But they were still doing work <coughs> that was positive for Christ. Well, who were these Nicolaitans? Who were these Nicolaitans? Not a lot here in this context said about them. Most of what we have to uh, derive is from uh, non-inspirational sources, the most. But uh, who, who, who do you think were these Nicolaitans? He was a proselyte of... Yes, Nicholas. Yeah. He was a proselyte. He was a Jewish proselyte. He held the doctrine of Balaam. Yes. He held the doctrine of Balaam. Well, what was all that about? What were the chief tenets of that doctrine? <coughs> Idolatry. Right? Fornication. And that would be similar, wouldn't it? To, um, to the time of the first century in the context in which these seven churches were set. Right? Rome had its issues. Corinth had its issues. Um, the worship of the goddess Diana. Idolatry and fornication. That's what Balaam was all about. You know? A lack of respecting authority. That's simply what the doctrine of the Nicolaitans were. Fornication was quite prevalent in the first century world, even under the umbrella of worship. Can you imagine? Remember all the port cities? <coughs> Eating meat sacrificed to an idol? Why do you think that takes up so much space in the New Testament? As, in and of itself now, a matter of indifference. But some were doing that in worship. And that's what made eating meats offered to the idols wrong and requiring that it be done in some cases. This was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And they hated that false teaching. And so did the Lord. And the Lord expected it to be dealt with. But not to the neglect of the first principle. There were Nicolaitans in Ephesus, and the Ephesians would have nothing.
nothing to do with it. So this, uh, this part, this letter to the church at Ephesus closes out like every letter to the churches here are closed out. Here, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, is communicating with your spirit. What's your spirit? Simply your mind. Let your ear, let the Spirit speak to your ear, to your spirit, to him that overcomes. Right? There's only one choice in life. Either overcome or be overcome. We can overcome with the Lord Jesus Christ and with the sword of the what? Spirit. So hear what the Spirit is saying to the church at Ephesus initially and to the church at Woodstock now. He that overcomes will I give to eat of the... <clears throat> oh, this is interesting. When did we first hear the tree of life? Way back. Way back in Eden. What was the main problem when Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden? What didn't they have access to? Yeah, the tree of life. They chose the other tree. Instead of running and eating from the tree of life, they chose the other tree. And when they chose the other tree, they broke that marriage that they had with God, and God had to put them away. And if they wanted to return to their first love, they could do it. I mean, I'm hoping to see Adam and Eve in heaven. I don't know that I will, but I'm hoping to. Don't know that for sure. Do we? But I hope so. But the same can be said for them. Repent and do the first works. What would the first works for Adam and Eve have been? Respect the authority of God, right? And to love him enough to do what he says and to keep that relationship. Return to your first love. Do the first works, Adam and Eve, and it could be said for every single person that has sinned since Adam and Eve. If they were in a covenant relationship with God, right? He's talking to people who, who have had a covenant relationship with God because they left it. Now, the majority of people have never had that relationship, that have ever lived. But he's talking about his people here. All right. Him that overcome, I will give each to the tree of life. And when do we get to the tree of life? <clears throat> We can have access, we can, we can receive the blessings of the tree of life now, but Adam and Eve lost their paradise. They lost their perfect environment, right? Until sin entered the picture, it was perfect. Paradise. Paradise lost, paradise what? Regained through the cross. We can now come back to our first love, and we can be confident. That we again can be in the paradise of God. And this message rings clear. Not only in these letters, but in the whole Bible. That was a tremendous promise for those early Christians, wasn't it? Because life was hard. Temptations were great. Many tried to force them to worship the Roman emperor. And it would be easy to leave that first love. But they were strong enough to overcome and not worship the emperor. And the Lord promised the Ephesian Christians that they could eat of the tree of life instead of eating at the worldly tables of the Roman emperors. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. This is the great church that's lasted for a long time. It was a great religious center. It was the third great missionary center of the Roman Empire from which the Christians took the gospel to every nook and corner of the Roman world. 
It can be done. It can be done. Any questions now about the church at Ephesus? We're going to church number two now. All right. The church of Smyrna. The church of Smyrna. Um, this was a church that nothing bad was said about it. It was a good church. Smyrna was located about 40 miles north of Ephesus. So 40 miles from church number one to church number two. That doesn't sound like too much in our day, but back then, that was a pretty good distance. Uh, it was one of the most beautiful and productive harbors of its time. When you thought of Smyrna, you would probably, in our day and time, what would you equate that with? Uh, I don't know. Aspen, Colorado, maybe, but not as mountains. A beautiful place. Smyrna was beautiful. It was on the end of a trade route. Uh oh. It was on the end of a trade route that ran to the north and to the east from Smyrna across Central Asia Minor. And it would run to other commercial areas. The land around Smyrna was extremely fertile. The city itself was an important first century Roman city. It always allied itself with Rome. We all like one of them, don't we? So when a battle came, Smyrna was always ready to side with Rome. And in AD 23, Smyrna vied with Ephesus and Pergamum for the privilege of erecting the first temple to Tiberius Caesar. How do we know Tiberius Caesar? When did he reign? Yeah, he was the reigning emperor when Jesus died, wasn't he? Who was the emperor when Jesus was born? Somebody said it. Yes. Augustus. Yes. Tiberius was reigning when Jesus died, and Smyrna wanted to erect the first, not the church. You know that, right? The city. Wanted to erect the first temple to him. Smyrna won the contest, and the temple was dedicated to Tiberius, the contemporary emperor, and to his mother, Julia. Smyrna, like so many of the cities, was a very religious city. What other city do we remember from the book of Acts when Paul went into it? He said, I perceive that you all are very beautiful. Religious. Who was that? Athens. Yes, Athens. Well, Smyrna was a very religious city filled with religious people, as was Ephesus. What Diana was to the Ephesians, Dionysius was to the Smyrna. Dionysius was also known as Bacchus. And he was the god of, guess what? Wine. Wine. What's wine mean in the New Testament usage? Simply? What does oinos mean? Oh, we need to know this. What does wine mean? Somebody. It's a, it made Great, great. Yeah, just juice of the grape. That's all wine means in the New Testament. Remember, words have a way of changing meanings. Today, wine doesn't just mean grape juice, does it? It means what they call in Africa, what? Chibuku? Yeah. Chibuku. But Dionysus was the god of wine. And uh, wine was used in many uh, get-togethers, moral and immoral. And out of this came a religion. Imagine that. Can you imagine what all has been done in the name of religion? Much of the immorality of Smyrna and the surrounding area came as a result of the worship of not only Diana, but of Dionysius. The empirical cult was also prominent in Smyrna. Many Jews in Smyrna were officers in city affairs. 
And the city, we're told, had at least one large synagogue. Smyrna had a beautiful city with a golden street that ran from one end of the city to the other. Imagine that. Probably the most beautiful street in the Roman Empire at that time, all roads lead to Rome, the most pretty, the most beautiful, was in Smyrna. The street, and it was just one. By the way, when you sing about heaven and you sing about the streets of gold, you need to take the S off of that word, the MS, too. The Bible talks about the street of gold, and there was this street of gold in Smyrna. It had wide streets. <coughs> On Mount Pagos, it had a theater that seated 30,000 people, which was larger than the theater, we would call them stadiums today, I guess, which is larger than the theater at Ephesus, even though Ephesus was even a bigger and more prominent city. Smyrna was an important city. The Muslim city today of Izmir, Turkey, now stands where ancient Smyrna stood. And so, was that the first bell or the second bell? Oh, okay. first, first. All right. And so, to the church of Smyrna, the angel. <laughs> You're not saying that with glee, are you? All right. I will stop. We will pick up with the church at Smyrna. That's next time. <laughs>